Hi, Mickey. Hey, how uh, you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. Wearing my Blogging Heads t-shirt. Oh, really? Great. Yeah. Is that to make up for your uh, dereliction of duty last week? You know, we missed you. It was tough. It was a tough week without you. We, uh... I void in my heart you. kind of thing. You're doing perfectly well without me. I've looked at your stats. No, no. It was, oh, we had, to, we had to settle for, you know, second-rate talents like Mike Kinsley. It was tough, man. There's, nobody can feel your shoes. Are you going to suck up to me like you sucked up to Kinsley for the first four minutes of your interview? Yes. I, I could barely get through that. It was such a love fest. No, but it, it, it's all oh, true. Mike's, okay. a, Mike's a great figure in journalism. Not that you're not. I mean, you are, really. I, I mean, know, I know, but, why did, but people don't want to hear that. Uh, okay, yeah, well, I was true. just kidding anyway. But, but you know, the other thing, it, it's, been, uh, it's been a tough week because, uh, you know, our production manager, Brian Degenhart, is uh, vacationing off in Israel. And if, uh, if he was trying to show us that he's indispensable, it's like mission accomplished. Okay, Brian, could you, uh, <laughs> could you return from the promised land before this thing falls completely apart? Um, uh, you, you are identified in the New York Times as head of Blogging Heads TV. No, not as head of Blogging Heads TV. What it actually said was runs the website. I, I couldn't. I, I was. I couldn't figure out a title. But it was head Blogging Head? Is, was that is that too cute? Yes. Yes. So runs. I, runs sort of sounded like you were the tech guy. Well, <laughs> this week I am. So that was perfect. But if you think of a title for me, if anybody else does, I, I would be happy to use it. I, I need a title. I called myself Grand Vitara at California. Yeah, Czar. So, yeah, whatever. Um, the, uh, uh, I hope you're not planning on getting a lot of hits from that New York Times plug for blogging. No, I actually told people in advance that that's not, that that's not what it yeah, I, I mean, general references to a website in, in, on, on paper, on dead wood, do not steer a lot of traffic. On the other hand, it's a kind of visibility you would like. We, we should probably tell people it was the author's bio in a column in the New York Times off that page that you're referring to. Yeah. We should tell. Now, Bob, here's the problem. Yeah. My camera seems to have gone into demo mode. Oh, excellent. Okay. Now, now should I? Should we stop it? Should I go behind the camera and fiddle with it? Uh, well, first of all, let's don't lose this footage. This is great. Uh, but I don't seem to be doing, I don't think I'm doing, like, turning into a hexagon spinning disco ball or anything. Oh. Maybe I am. I can't What are you seeing on your screen? It says direct, print, shoot, connect, and print. No computer required. Cool. What, what, what do you see on the screen that's on your computer? Are you looking at that? Uh, it looks fine on my computer. And the digits are flying by? Uh, yes, they are. I'm sorry to say that I think uh, it's probably all fine. Okay, so we should just keep going. We should gamble. It's a big gamble. <laughs> okay. I don't know, you know, but there's probably a limit to how long we should agonize in full public view. Okay, let's stop agonizing. Okay. Let's do, let's um, do like 20 minutes and, and, and then maybe stop and check or something. So, um, uh, so what, okay. what about this, uh, this whole uh, politics of Iraq thing? Um, uh, well, it, I, you know, everybody's talking about, well, who's going to win this great tussle between the Congress and the executive branch? Is it like the 95 tussle between Gingrich and the White House? And I tend to think, uh, no, okay, now I'm turning into a disco ball, by the way. Oh, you are? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, good. Uh, that's so cool. The only trouble is it, it, it periodically interferes with your audio, so I'm afraid... I'm afraid we do have to actually fix this uh, problem, but uh, we want to preserve this for posterity, so let's don't, uh, so don't do anything rash. Down. Just press uh, stop. Break now and then come back yeah. later? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Mickey, you're back. Yeah, I, as I was saying, I tend to see this is not an epic showdown because I, I think it's all kabuki. I think the Democrats... W it's in the Democrats' interest to try really hard, to seem to be trying really hard to stop the war, but to just barely fail. And it's in Bush's interest to see, have the Democrats seem to be trying really hard to stop the war, because that gives them leverage with Maliki, and to ultimately fail. So if they both want it, that's what's going to happen. It's not like 95 when, they, when Gingrich really wanted to take over the government from Congress. But wait, Mickey, it's a zero-sum game unless there's some kind of third party or independent candidate that enters the picture, so they can't both be winning. Uh, it's it, well. Bush cares about his Iraq policy, not necessarily about winning the next election. Uh, so I don't think that's I don't think he's playing the zero sum game. 
Well, I think he I cares about he legacy can. at this point. I mean, uh, tell me, I mean, here's the way I see it. Okay, so the Democrats passed this spending bill, and they put in it this restriction that, you know, there's a timetable for withdrawal. Right. Bush, in the short term, likes being seen saying, you guys are not supporting our troops. I'm going to veto this bill on behalf of our troops. He's liking this, right? He thinks he's liking he, it. Well, okay. Uh, I think he, he, he's more the arbiter of what he's liking than I am. Um, the, well, I, the point is that he, he thinks he's, you think he's showing bad political, political judgment, maybe. Yeah. But, but, okay, well, you can explain why. But, but the Democrats, I think the Democrats are playing a risky game. I mean, what, what, what they're, and their plan is, of course, after he vetoes it, I presume they're just going to say, well, okay, we're certainly not going to not support the troops, so here's your spending bill without the timetable, but let, let the record show that we tried. Right. And then, uh, you know, history unfolds, and the Democrats, um, they look fine if a year and a half from now the Iraq War looks as, like as big a mess as ever, and everybody's saying, oh, we should have started pulling out long ago. This is hopeless. They look bad if uh, our, uh, we have a lot of troops there, and the situation is manifestly stabilizing, and it looks like the presence of these troops has been a prerequisite for it stabilizing. That, that's when the Republicans could make the case that the Democrats were on the wrong side, right? right. I'm with you so far. Well, so why, uh, what, is it, what is it you think Bush is, is doing wrong here? Is what how, does what you, how does what you said differ from what I said? The, 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 the Democrats are make, are, think the war is going to go badly, and they don't really want to win this vote fight right now. They want, they, want, they, they want to fail to cut off the troops, have the surge go forward, have it be a disaster, and have it be completely in Bush's lap. That's... What they think, where they think they're in. But it seems like in both the short term and the long term, unless there happens to be a dead heat between these two sides, there has to be a political winner and a political loser. Right, but it depends what happens in Iraq. It depends the surge is a success, the Republicans win if it's a failure, the Democrats. Right, the long term solution does, but but you know, but what about in the short term? If we if we go through this scenario where a bill passes finally uh, without any any timetable, you're saying that doesn't help either group or. Well, it doesn't help either because we're going to find out what happens in Iraq before there's an, another election. I mean, obviously, if it, okay. You know, so short short term is really ephemeral. You're saying, and, short, and all that matters term. is a year and a half from now, and that depends on things we don't know yet. Yes, the the reason it's a it's a miscalculation for Bush is I just think people are sick of the the style of politics where you heighten the contradictions and then say, you know, the Democrats are in favor of killing our troops in Iraq. Uh, you know, defunding our troops in the middle of a war. I mean, that's sort of the standard Bush ploy. He's tried it on issue after issue, as opposed to like a conciliatory, let's talk, let's work this out uh, position. And, and it's failed on issue after issue, and it's not working for him anymore. Now, it happens that in this case, he happens to be more or less right, I think. Uh, I think a funding cutoff, uh, a timetable would be bad. But, you know, the threat of a timetable is good, so... Seems to me slightly risky politics for the Democrats in the sense that if they just hadn't done anything, then he would just own the war. And, 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 and it's like uh, a year and a half from now, he would definitely be looking bad, right? Because, because, you, because even if it's like stabilizing then and our troops are helping, everybody's still looking back and going, oh, this war was a mistake. Except then he wouldn't be able to look back and go, well, it would be a bigger one if the Democrats had well, had their way point. Bush, in the Bush spring of 07. Bush has made the issue not whether the war was a stupid idea, but whether the surge was a stupid idea. Not whether the last you know, six years have been bad, but whether the last six months have been bad. And he might win the, the next six months, but the war was still a stupid idea, yeah. You're right. So he, to that extent, the Democrats have been... Uh, been narrowing the, the, the arena of the fight. Right, yeah, right. So they're creating, they they're creating a narrower issue that could possibly work against them rather than just to leave it at a broad issue, the wisdom of the war that definitely is going to be working for them in a year and a half, yeah, almost the, certainly. The, the problem is, is, A, they have to placate the people that put them in power, i.e. the base, and, 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 uh, and B, they really believe that uh, they've talked themselves into this idea that uh, if we pulled the troops out and set a deadline that somehow that would, uh, when we pulled out, somehow uh, there wouldn't be a horrible bloodbath, that there, our troops are the problem as opposed to uh, preventing a problem. Yeah, they it's really, kind of puzzling. Really that, so. I mean, I could see the case 
uh, I, I can see a substantive case to want to remove the power from Bush's hands, in a sense. In other words, I mean, my, 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 my basic view is, you know, if you have like a wise, all-knowing being in charge of the whole, uh, our strategy, you would not want to remove from that person's hands, uh, you know, the option of leaving the troops there. It may well be that, 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 you know, we get a less bad outcome by leaving the troops there for a while. That's totally possible. But, I, on the other hand, it's clearly the power is not in the hands of an all-wise being. That is, it is in Bush's hands. Moreover, uh, an all-power, an all-knowing wise being. Moreover, we know that he has a very uh, distinct kind of personal psychological bias working here, which is the following. I mean, I think at this point he's thinking, you know, largely about legacy, and if if he pulls the troops out, even if that would lead lead to the least bad outcome. He knows his legacy is shot, right? Because it's, it's just going to go down that, well, he pulled them out, and then chaos reigned a while, well, and finally it stabilized. No thanks to him. Blah, blah, I, blah. If you really believe some of the more rosy scenarios of a troop pullout, we, we pull the troops out, they cut these deals that are going to let them uh, coexist, and, and basically uh, a, you know, a tenuous peace grips Iraq. Yeah. And in, in that case, if we have a tenuous peace gripping Iraq, uh, where they can rebuild with Saddam out of power, with the Shiites controlling their own destiny and the Kurds controlling their own destiny, the, the war doesn't look so bad. Well, no, but even there, the narrative is that things finally took an upward turn when we undid what Bush had done. That is when we pulled the troops out of Iraq. Well, but that's, yeah, wait, but that's quick. different from the narrative where Bush sticks it out and he stands by his guns and he leaves those troops in and they actually help things get better and we're there to oversee it and orchestrate it. I think that's a much better narrative for his legacy. Well, how, well it's more Churchillian, but why but wouldn't Republicans quickly shift to a we went, we did the job, we came home? It's not like Vietnam. They would do their best. I just think he would have a hard time at the hands of historians then, and I, and I think he's kind of thinking legacy. And I, and I think this does bias his judgment. He just has a bias against withdrawal. But don't, um, but don't, right, but don't you think, I mean, it's all up to Petraeus. If Petraeus concludes in a year that the strategy isn't working, do you think he wouldn't have the balls to say it's not working, in which case uh, the Churchill strategy doesn't look so good? Well, I think once he's enmeshed in it, he has a little bit of the same kind of natural bias. I don't know anything about him as a person. I don't know to what extent he'd be able to detach himself from that. But, um, you know, people, people, I mean, probably an easier time because basically the whole thing was not his idea, you know. But yeah. I mean, didn't, didn't he, he also covered, covered himself uh, beforehand by telling some congressman it had a one in four chance of working? Oh, uh, I, uh, I, I think I remember that quote, yeah. No, he, his media relations are pretty good. Um, and I, I, but, but your sense is still that the surge is, is working, right? Yeah, and my sense is that Bush's options are circumscribed enough now by his previous failures and by public opinion that it's not, you, you know, you said he's not all wise and all seeing, but he also is not all powerful anymore. And, and, and he, you know, he's hit on a more sensible strategy, and it'll either work or not. I don't see... And maybe I just lack imagination for the, the, the crazy things he could do. The crazy thing he could do is start a war in, in Iran, and, and, and that, that prospect has abated dramatically today. Uh, yeah, a hostage thing seems to be resolved. Um, I, wonder, I wonder, I mean, I guess we'll get the backstory on that probably, like, you know, it's probably happening now. But I, I, do you have any story. sense for why, uh, how it got resolved? Well, what, what, Britain had started yeah. actually talking a little bit, a little bit tough. But I don't, it's hard to imagine that that immediately did the trick. There was obviously a hostage swap of some sort. Well, do we know that? Well, it said in the, in the story I read that we released, we happened to have released an, an Iranian diplomat we'd captured uh, yesterday or the day before. Yeah, I mean, I had heard all along that uh, actually, to the extent that there was a clear motivation of this, of their, of, of Iran seizure, the British hostages, it had to do with those four or five Iranian guys that, that we, uh, that we took uh, in Iraq, and, and I guess they're still. Uh, we let them. Well, we let them be visited by the Iranian diplomats. So we we stopped holding them in communicado. Hmm. The um, the I mean, it was sort of crazy. I mean, obviously, there's also internal uh, divisions in, in Iran. I mean, it was sort of crazy for them when we're looking for a reason to go to war with them 
to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons to give us a reason to go to war with them. Yeah, no, I was thinking, So I was thinking, look, you know, I mean, but when this thing seemed like it wasn't going to get resolved, I was thinking, look, if you are going to bomb the nuclear reactor, you know, I'm not in favor of it, but this would be the time because you would have, I mean, you would, you would want to heighten the whole, the whole tension a little and say, look, you know, give them an ultimatum and everything. But in terms of how it's going to look in the eyes of the international community, you know, you might as well do it while, while the Iranians are doing something that's hard to defend. Um, but yeah, anyway, right. didn't happen. But hot. you're still in favor uh, uh, of war with Iran, right? That's it. But you, it sounds like you are. This is the most hawkish you've been. Uh, no, in, you know, no, what? no. It was, no, I, it was, the key qualifier was if you're going to do it, yeah. you should do it you when you look relatively good in the court of, of world opinion. So, um, so, so, no, I, 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 I do not endorse war with Iran. I mean, I did have uh, some, so, uh, a weak moment or two during the hostage crisis where, you know, it is so just kind of annoying when they do things like this that, 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 that you know, I was thinking, wow, it, it would, you know, wouldn't that kind of teach Ahmadinejad a lesson and kind of wipe the smile off his face uh, if, if, you know, you happen to bomb his nuclear reactor, but, but, but. Uh, that was just my, the reptilian core of my brain briefly seizing control, uh, and then I returned to, to my normal diplomatic uh, frame of mind. But um, good. Well, I'm glad you admit that uh, that you have these these reptilian impulses. Oh, worse than most people's for sure. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I, I'm I, I'm a particularly egregious example of a human being. Yes. The, we just will settle for normal, Bob. I would settle for normal. I'm saying it's worse than that. But anyway. We just want to know you're not Michael Dukakis. If somebody I am not Michael you, Dukakis. About your wife being, you know, bad things happening to your wife. You'll I would not yourself. say, hey, you know, bad <laughs> things happen. I'd say off with his head. But then I would regain possession of my uh, senses after a few, after, after we had killed him. Um, so anyway, but wait, are you, you alluded at one point to, to, to seeing the logic behind war with Iran. Oh, I th there's, there, there's logic. If they actually give us a provocation uh, to, to, that will be recognized by the world as a Pearl Harbor-like invitation to go to war, and we go to war, and, we, and that's before they get nuclear weapons, uh, you know, that, that, that might be a, a, you know, a gift from the gods. Well, would the hostage thing have qualified as that? I don't, think it quite, I don't think it's quite that severe. Well, I think they're not going to be stupid enough to give us something like that. But it was close. <laughs> it was close. It was more than the Pueblo incident, which started, you know, which was our pretext for having the Vietnam War. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, there was that news story about how we had tried to capture some high Ar Iranian security officials in that raid where we have these, we have these guys that we've now let the Iranians uh, visit, uh, that we were actually looking for some bigger fish, the head of the Revolutionary Guards Intelligence Unit, yeah. who happened to be in that town. And... Th that you know that seems very a very provocative act on our part. So I do think we've sort of been trying to goad them into a provocation. But the fact that the <coughs> the fact that he released these guys implies that he that he they realize that and they they no longer want to be provoked. Yeah, I, I think they don't want to give us a pretext. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I mean, the in, other in, the other in terms of the the back to the the Democrats, uh, you know, political strategy on the Iraq War. The other, and the interesting counterpoint to that, to me, is this Pelosi visit to Syria, which seems to me, I mean, the, the first thing, you know, uh, the, the Iraq spending bill, to the extent that that turns out to be a bad political idea, and it could be, um, it seems to me it kind of, it's kind of a routine kind of bad political idea in the sense that it flows from political forces that are conspicuous, as you alluded to, you know, their constituents have been pushing them for this. The, the people who got them elected have been pushing for this. Right. And so naturally, you know, you know, you kind of half-consciously stumble into what turns out to be a kind of political trap or whatever. That, that happens. But I don't think, I don't think, yeah, okay, it could be a trap, but I think, you know, at the moment they, they think they will. Right, but, but, I'm, but I'm just saying, in, in contrast, the Syrian thing seems to me politically risky in a kind of creative, you know, it, it kind of took some imagination to generate this political risk, right? And in what sense? Do, do you agree with me, first of all, that it's a little risky uh, politically for Pelosi to go tra traipsing off to uh, Syria? Yes. And what do you see as the risk? 
Well, the risk is that you'll look like Jesse Jackson going off to, ne to, to negotiate with our enemies and, and undermining our, the official diplomacy that the White House is engaged with. I think there's that. I think there's the added uh, concern for the Jewish vote, right? right. See, it, it, I mean, she went to Israel first. She went to Syria and, I guess, met with Assad. And uh, her spokespeople, are, are, the line from her was, we delivered a message from Israel that Israel is ready for peace talks, basically. This, this I found in a, uh, in, in a piece for, in, in uh, Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper. Right, I and, I thought, and I thought, whoa, masterful. I mean, if she's got the Israeli prime minister behind her on this, right, saying, yes, this was a needed, you know, she speaks for us and this was a valuable message to get through, then she's presumably fine politically. But then she, he was not covering her back. A spokesman for the Israeli government said, an unidentified one, said, uh, well, our position, you know, we told, our position remains the same. We, you know, we won't talk with them until they quit supporting Hezbollah, blah, blah, blah. So as of now, she's left out on the limb, to, me, in, to my mind, looking, uh, you know, a little, uh, a little awkward. Huh, well, but, but I thought Omer had been also saying nice things about the Saudi peace plan. O so, Omer was also saying what? Nice things about the Saudi peace initiative, which is... Well, he may, but the question is, is he going to validate her trip to Syria or, or not? And because if he doesn't, I, I, I think she, she could look bad in the eyes of Americans. But you don't... I mean, it, it, it's entirely possible that the, you know, the, that, uh, that, that this statement saying our position remains the same was just an attempt to quell sort of domestic opposition and that, that she's being completely accurate in what... Uh, you know, the, the two are not inconsistent and will not, uh, and that, the, you know, the American Jewish vote, which you worry about, uh, will not think that she was somehow, uh, you know, doing something against the wishes of the Israeli government. Well, it could be. I mean, an interesting part of the context is that reportedly Israel was actually interested in, in doing more in the way of Syrian initiatives than the Bush administration was comfortable with, and the Bush administration was actually restraining Israel from doing even even the kind of level of communication they wanted to try out with Syria. That was at least reported. Again, maybe that was in, uh, I forget if it was in Haaretz or maybe the well, Jerusalem that Post. Explain, that would explain this trip. If well, they couldn't get Bush to do it, they got Pelosi. Well, I doubt, they, I doubt she did it at their beckoning, but, but it, could, it could be why it seemed to make sense for her, yes. And, and if so, she's probably feeling not too happy about, the, about what, what Olmert's spokespeople are, are anonymously saying now. But, um, and you know, in that sense, it might, it might, I, I'm generally skeptical of diplomatic freelancing, both extra governmentally, like, you know, kind of, uh, you know, brothers to the rescue in Cuba, and, and in this case, you know, uh, you know, within the government, Pelosi, but, but from a different branch of government. I, I'm generally skeptical of that. But I gotta say, Bush has, you know, shown so little willingness through most of his institute, his term to, to, Exploit kind of obvious avenues of overture that I, I you know, I, 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 my, my inclination is to say, sure, give it a try. Well, that's not my inclination, but my, but and Pelosi is really playing with fire in the sense that uh, people get the sense that that she has the same disease that Gingrich had, which is you get elected speaker to the house and you think you've been president. In her case, you know, she thinks she's sort of queen, and and that's the way. There's a danger that that's the way it will be characterized. And she runs around, immediately runs around, starts doing her own foreign policy. Uh, even Gingrich, I don't think, did that really. He just tried to eliminate Medicare, but um, and, and, and so construct I, I, a whole I, philosophical system for which he would ever get credit, forever get credit. But but go ahead. Yes, but uh, anyway, so I, I, I don't think uh, I don't think I support it as as as, as somebody who doesn't want. Uh, I don't know. Why don't I want Pelosi to destroy herself? I don't. I don't think I do. So <laughs> actually, I think the inner Mickey almost admitted that you do. But but let's don't go there. Um, I uh, I don't know. But it, but it, you know it, it is true that she has given Assad uh, a little bit of a lift here. Um, you know it, it it helps him to be taken seriously uh, by this very prominent American politician. So you would like. For us, for somebody to get something in return for it, right? You, you would, and I would think if she's smart, she would say that to him. She, you know, she needs him to now do something that shows that this was fruitful. But 
if she was, if she, first of all, if she was trying to do that kind of deal with old Mert, something, she seems to have not made things sufficiently clear. And, uh, and I don't know. We'll see if, if anything comes out of a side. You would, you would also think that she would have somehow wired the reaction of the American Jewish community ahead of time. How do you do unless that? She's, unless she's more ballsy than I think she is. Yeah, but she'd have to be more powerful than I think she is to uh, prearrange that. What, like send out a million emails and tell them not to tell anybody or what? No, she talked to them and said, "Look, I'm going to Syria. You're not going to be. Ma- you're not going to like say that I'm somehow stabbing the cause of Israel in the back by doing this." So she'd say this to ten prominent Jewish leaders or something? Yeah, or the heads of APAC, something like that. Okay. Yes. okay. Ten prominent Jewish. The, 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 she said to the Council of Major Jewish Organizations. I don't know about his. I don't know. You know, Jewish politics. So I don't know who she talked to, but I think there are people to talk to. Okay. Um, so anyway, there's that. Anything more in the Middle East before we move into whatever we're going to move into? No. Nothing more in the Middle East. We've exhausted our ignorance. Yes. Uh, uh, I'll, have more to, I'll have more to say about our ignorance later. You have more to say about my ignorance later, right? No. You're, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna give me trouble about this uh, New York Times op-ed, right? No, yeah. Um, uh, eventually, yes. No, I'll, I'll say it now. I mean, we, we've had comments in the in the comments section saying you you guys are just two guys don't really know about Iraq. Uh, you just you read what's in what's on the web uh, before you go in the air and you react to that. And I say, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, the alternative is sort of you know punditry where you actually know something, and and that's not my idea of what blogging heads is about. My bl- idea of blogging heads is two guys chewing over what's in the news. Right on. That's our business model. So Could become our slogan. I'm, I'm not Ken Pollock. And sometimes gals, Mickey. Right, that too. Um, um, anyway, so I plead guilty to, as Eric Alderman put it, wankery, not wankery. You wear your ignorance as a badge of honor. Yep. Um, okay. Speaking, well, anyway, I don't know how good a transition this is. You want to talk about this David Brooks column? I do want to talk about the David Brooks column because... I okay, mean, first we should tell people what it is. Yeah, David Brooks wrote a column called No U-Turns where he talked about how the conventional conservative idea of uh, that the government is oppressive uh, and that an increase in the size of government inevitably reduces individual liberty, and this is sort of the conventional... Uh, Reagan Goldwater model of get the government off our back, shrink the size of government, uh, doesn't work anymore. And that the new, he cites an article in uh, Cato Unbound by Tyler Cowen. Of the blog Marginal Revolution. Right. Uh, where he argues that this paradigm doesn't work anymore. And the new paradigm uh, is something like. Uh, something like liberalism! Something like exactly. what the Democrats are saying. But anyway, go ahead. That's my reading like of the column. Is it's, it's an elaborate attempt to, to say, you know, in, in this complicated way, what boils down to the Democrats are doing a better job of, of addressing the needs and concerns of Americans. Let's be more like Democrats. Now, maybe you can explain to me why that's not what he's saying. But that's, that's you know. No, that's, it seems to me he was saying three things. He, I guess his platform was, was what, security? Uh, the platform is now that... Uh, uh, security leads to freedom, is how he puts it. Uh, uh, and it seems to me there, there's sort of uh, there's sort of three ways in which that's possible. One is uh, that obviously you have to have physical security uh, before you can have anything else, which is sort of a truism and not all that interesting. And as Andrew Sullivan points out in, in a critique of Brooks, is, is, is you know that's why conservatives support the police force. I mean, and the Defense Department. Right. Not, not news. Okay. So, okay. Not news. The second is that you need a welfare state as a platform for risk-taking. Uh, in other words, I'll be much more willing to invest in a, in a crazy venture like blogging heads if I know I have health insurance. I'm not going to starve to death. The, the safety net. Well, moreover, it's, it's about coping with the, the challenge of globalization, I think, yes. and, and a very fluid economy. Right. Uh, you know, and, and the end of the model of the employer for life, you know, right. the corporate right. parent and so on. Right, right. And um, uh, it seems to be in that sense... It's exactly what you say. After you know, two weeks after proclaiming neoliberalism is dead, 
uh, David Brooks has said that he is a neoliberal. Uh, uh, I, you know, he says, well, even if you accept this, there will still be debates between left and right. But it seems to me he's pretty much accepted uh, not only uh, a whole chunk of liberalism, but also a whole chunk of the neoliberal critique of liberalism, which is that, you know, we're for the welfare state, but we can't guarantee you security like you had in World War II. That's not going to happen. Uh, so he's, he's just Bill Clinton. I mean, Brooks, is, which is fine. I agree with him. Right, but, but, but he's just saying we need to move to the left. Sorry? He's saying Republicans need to move to the left. It, it, it really wouldn't necessarily take 800 words, unless you were trying to almost obscure the fact that that's what you're saying. Right, well, I think he is. But, yeah. uh, but, but, also, but, but he also holds out this hope that once, you know, once he moves to the left, uh, th that he'll still have a big argument with the Democrats. You know, he says, you know, these ideas will... Uh, uh, moves to moving to this new paradigm doesn't end debate between left and right. It just engages it on a different ground. It is oriented less toward negative liberty, how can I get the government off my back, and more toward positive liberty. Can I choose how to lead my life? Right. And, well, it, it, That's, and I don't where, so give me an example of one of these left-right arguments that will happen once he's shifted to the right. left. I don't, you know, this is another attempt to create disagreements where I don't think there really are necessarily disagreements. Uh, basically, David Brooks is on the, you know, movement to the right wing of the Democratic Party. Great. Right. No, I mean, the, this paragraph that you started reading and I finished reading just, first of all, took me a while to wrap my mind around because ultimately it, it so far as I could tell, was actually saying nothing. I mean, you know, as you said, well, the, uh, here, here's, the, here's the third sense I thought where he might be saying something, which is he's saying conservatives have to grapple with a new level of complexity. An idea that should appeal to you, Bob. I like complexity, yes. Uh, since you said all of history was a blazing arrow leading toward more complexity in your book, Non-Zero. Um, and, and it's sort of like, it's sort of like you know, a PC, a personal computer, is a very complex thing. Uh, but once we have that level of complexity, it's enabled, uh, it's, it's a platform for an unprecedented exercise in freedom and liberty in terms of blogging and all the things that it ena enables people to do. And, that, and, and he's saying, well, we should maybe see government like that. In other words, let's forget the Wild West. We're in the 21st century. Government is inevitably going to be complex. It's going to have big computers. Uh, it's going to have a fairly large bureaucracy. Uh, we just have to learn to live with this and, and build our freedom on top of that. Uh, and I thought that was an interesting idea. That's what I liked about the column. Okay, I'm not sure I'm... Um, Does that make any sense at all? Well, I'm not sure I grasped enough of it to respond to it. I want to run to this point by well, me again, I and I will respond I, uh, sagely. I, I, I heard Brian Doherty talk about his new history of libertarianism, and he points out that a lot of the key libertarians were actually people in the western part of the United States who were, you know, ranchers, farmers. They lived in a, in a, in a society without a large state presence. They carried guns, uh, and that was the sort of level of technology that libertarianism was w arose out of. Okay, so my, my interpretation of Brooks is sort of a Marxist thing. It, now we're in a different level of technology. We can't have the old libertarianism of the Wild West, which is sort of Reaganism and Goldwaterism, where the government either get, you know, is in your business or gets off your back. Uh, we need a sort of new paradigm in which the government is, is there, it's omnipresent, it's, you, know, you can't get around it. There's a, there's a, a web of, of, of government, and, and the question is, uh, is that going to be a government that's going to enable freedom or hamper freedom? Uh, you know, the problem with that is, is this, the same problem I have with Brooks, which is I don't think you get much argument in America as to what sort of, you know, that we want it to be a platform for freedom. So everybody converges on the center. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I still have no sophisticated response and still haven't totally grokked it. I mean, you, you're basically saying that the, the context in which Goldwater-era conservatism arose was really kind of uh, unique. Well, it was unique, almost an aberration. It was one of the modes of production, sort of. It was, it was the, the, the West. That was a big part of America. Uh, was it? But, well, I mean, it was yeah, big enough for Goldwater to come nowhere near living an elect, winning an election, I guess, yeah. Well, but, 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 but people are calling for, you know, we need, the Republicans, the, what Brooks is reacting to is the Republicans saying, we need another Goldwater, we need another Reagan. First, they, 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 you know, they say that, and, and Brian and, uh, sorry, and Ross and, and Matt talked about it in the last dialogue. There's this myth that Reagan, or myth or reality that Reagan was the heir to Goldwater, so Goldwater did eventually win. 
and that they're both sort of Western libertarians. And, and they, there was a, a leave us alone coalition in the Republican Party that just wanted to get the government off people's backs. Uh, and, and that was the real thing. And Brooks is saying we have to leave that behind. It's, it's, it's in the dustbin of history. It's been obsoleted by the forces of production, as Marx would well, say. Well, I agree with that. It just seems to me the main thing that's done that is globalization and, and, and the fact that everyone feels economically insecure. Well, he cites that. Yeah, he yeah, I'm Brooks, with him, so. I'm with him. I agree with that. Yeah. I just thought the PC analogy was a good one. I mean, I, uh, maybe I'm crazy. I like that analogy. Okay. Here's this really complex thing that you don't understand, you could never build yourself, but that it enables unprecedented freedom. You don't even have to know what's in the black box. Just, you know, and so, I don't know. It seems to me government could be like that. It could be a enabler of freedom, and, that, and that's a, a very powerful idea, it seems to me. It absolutely can be. I mean, and I think it's, it's an argument uh, from the left. I mean, because for one thing... Uh, you know, one thing libertarians, you know, hardcore libertarians or, or people on, on the far end of the Goldwater right, uh, you know, the, for example, people who complain about so-called takings, you know, that if you regulate their property in any way that's costly, that's the equivalent of the government seizing their property, you know? Right. Well, I think one thing they don't appreciate, Peter Singer made this point in a book, and I'm sure other people have made it, is that, you know, the government does a whole lot of things that are prerequisites for you owning property to begin with. In a state of nature, you know, you wouldn't own that property. Somebody with less money who really resents you would come along and kill you, right? I mean, the government, for starters, makes that impossible. For another thing they do is they set up all these regulations governing ownership, and they, they set up the whole system under which ownership is, is legitimate. So that, that, it seems to me that, that that point is kind of a lefty point. Right. It's, it's easy. I think libertarians have recognized that Singer objection and grappled with it for several decades. Um, but I agree with it. Um, so, anyway, I thought that was the good part of, 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 of Brooks. Um, I thought the good he, part of Brooks was, was saying, uh, yeah, the Democrats have got it right and we don't. I like that. Yeah. Well, the question, the larger question he raised, which I think you actually tangentially address in your bid for glory in the New York Times. You wrote an op-ed called My Life in the Army. Uh, True. It, 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 I mean, it was actually, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a guest columnist. I would not have written that as a regular op-ed. But Why anyway. Not? Why not? Well, it doesn't have an, uh, uh, you know, such a, well, you could, you could. But the point is, the only reason I felt free enough to write something in an, in an at all memoirish mode was that when you're a guest columnist for a month, you can write right. anything you want. They don't edit it. All you, all you deal with is a copy editor. So if you're ever going to get your father's name in the New York Times, which I did, uh, now is the time. I thought, was, I thought it was like the intro bio spot, meet Bob Wright. Well, I did. I, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I asked my wife. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I was thinking about a few ideas, and I, and I said, you know, do you think this makes sense as the first one? She said, yes, it does have a certain logic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, my point is... Uh, you portray the, the army as a sort of a bastion of what I call social equality. Uh, yes, I mean, know, part, the, part of the thesis was liberals should think more highly of the military, right. in part because the military itself embodies liberal values right. as an institution. And, yes, Right, and, and this relates to the issue of globalization, because in my mind, the, the way to react to globalization, which causes uh, a, a large gap to open up between uh, the rich and the poor, uh, is by... Enforcing social equality, not money equality. In other words, let rich people earn their money. Don't worry that David Geffen has a mansion in Malibu. Uh, uh, don't worry that he has fifty million dollars. But have some sort of uh, sphere where everybody interacts as an equal. The healthcare sphere is the obvious candidate, but in the, the highways are are, are are something where uh, that happens now. If we could have a draft and everybody would have this military experience that you have, that would be another sphere where everybody interacts more or less as equals uh, in some sense. Everybody and in what? That everybody interacts as equals. Oh, interacts. In other words. I thought you said in Iraq. Okay, go ahead. No. Well, that, that too. That too. But, um, uh, uh, it, it, it's a place where you don't get any privilege just because you're rich. You're, you know, if you're Donald Trump's son, you're in the Army like everybody else. Uh, that would be the virtue of a draft. I've sort of given up on the idea of a draft, but we want institutions like that that enforce social equality against the, the ever-increasing, or at least for the past few decades, increasing income inequality. Uh, and, and that's what I liked about your piece. 
Um, why did you think I wouldn't like it? Well, I don't think you like it. it, it the piece was a little, uh, well, it was not totally devoid of humanity. <laughs> My Bob, I'm the ro I'm not the robot of this show. You're the robot. I'm I'm Oscar. Yeah, but in reacting to writing, you never liked the part about actual human beings. That's the part you always strip out. Want to strip out of pieces? The anecdotes what? about people. Uh, and this some, had more more of that. The, the, there were some real people, but there weren't too many of them. Don't worry about that. It was basically your father and General Shinseki. That was about it, as far as I could see. And me implicitly, but yes. Uh, well, the, it wasn't overpopulated with real-world anecdotes, don't worry. <laughs> but um, they, well, you did effectively what I, you know, I wrote this book about social equality, and there's a chapter where, you know, in all these things where you have to, like, somehow get evocative about the public sphere where we're, we all interact as equals. And, 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 and that's always, like, incredibly dreary for me because it's sort of, it, they always sound the same. All those, all those paragraphs and chapters all sort of run together as, you know, and, and, and you managed to actually evoke it uh, without lapsing into cliché. So yeah, well, it was really it. true. I mean, it was an almost idyllic uh, environment in the sense that there was this kind of social mixing. In other words, you know, the, the, the Army's equivalent of blue-collar kids, that is, kids of, uh, uh, of you know, NCOs, soldiers who aren't officers, interact, go to the same schools with, are in the same Little League with, and so on, and are the friends of, the kids who are the, the sons of officers, which I was. Um, right. And it, it's funny, I was worried that I was over-romanticizing it or, um, or, or just, you know, re, you know, the way you do about childhood generally. But, but the most affirm I got some really interesting feedback about this, but the most affirmative was from the only, I think the only working journalist I know who was also an Army brat, who I know is an Army brat, which is, who is uh, Jay Tolson. Uh, he wrote a biography of Walker Percy, and he, and he writes right. for U.S. News. And uh, it just, he said, you know, totally, utterly, 100% resonated with, uh, with his experience. And, and, and it, really, well, it, really was a great, it really was a great kind of life. It, 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 right. It's weird, it's weird. A lot of, a lot of uh, uh, inegalitarian institutions seem to work because of a sort of secret egalitarianism, which was driven home to me when I heard David Geffen uh, one of the richest men in America described how he had to cut short his, uh, you're going to laugh at this, is, uh, cut short his vacation when the island was such a flop because he had to fly back to Hollywood to be with the troops in their time of crisis. <laughs> in other words, I'm sure he had to show that they were all in it together and that he was suffering the same anxiety that they were. Um, yeah, well... And, and that was, if, if, you know, if, if, if even in, Ho in Hollywood, you know, there's a secret egalitarianism uh, you know that 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 says a lot about about the need for human of humans for equal respect. Well, yeah, and in the military, the need for it is much more real. Uh, I but, mean, if you're, you know, uh, the, it's funny. The day before my piece uh, ran, it was already written, but the there was a story on the front page of the New York Times about this colonel, and it was about the pain in Iraq and about the pains he goes to. To show respect for the wounded and the dead, yeah. and uh, for all, you know, he's got 5,000 people under his command. Right. It's weird. There are two kinds of respect, though. There, I mean, even in feudal times, when there was a definite hierarchy and no social equality, and there were lords and servants and people in the middle and serfs, uh, everybody got respect as long as they knew their place. In other words, you would respect your, if your serf died, you would go to his funeral and show him respect, but it was respect as a serf. It was sort of as respect you know, one level, or several levels down. Uh, that is not what I mean by social equality. Social equality is a much more sort of revolutionary idea, which is not the feudal respect for you in your place, but respect as an equal in status. And I'm not sure that what you're talking about in the military isn't more the feudal respect. Well, I think there's a distinction between respect. what you see among the soldiers and what you see among the kids of the soldiers. I experienced, I was a kid. Okay. And my point was, uh, there was a lot more mixing in the sense of my having friends who were blacks and Hispanics and so on uh, than you would get in, in the real world. Okay. And we all went to the same doctors and got the same mediocre health care and were in the same little league and so on. That, that was my experience. But I, I do think, 
I mean, I, th I think among the soldiers, it's more like what you're talking about, where everyone's status is so clear that there's, you know, you don't have to spend it wasting time jockeying about that, really, on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, but that's not social equality that I missed that I'm misinterpreting your piece. In other words, dogs have a pecky order. If you put a bunch of dogs in, they'll have a fight, and then they'll have a hierarchy where the biggest dog, you know, and then yeah. the second biggest dog. And once they establish the hierarchy, they're all happy. Yeah. Okay. And the military seems like that, but that's not social equality. That's no, it's not. Uh, yeah, that's I, I, I don't think it's what you mean by social equality. But I would say the following: the hierarchy itself is really, I think, no more pronounced than it is in the corporate world. And the difference is there is more genuine, deep emotional bonding, both within grades and I think between them. I mean, I really was serious that. Uh, you know, you, good military commanders feel something for their troops that borders on love and is much closer to that than a corporate CEO uh, experiences. And well, there was bonding in feudal times, too. Well, maybe. That's not what uh, egalitarianism means. Maybe we shouldn't be egalitarians, but that's well, not I, all Well, it wasn't all means. about egalitarianism. I was saying there are yeah. various yeah. liberal values respected. And, and, I, and I think for, uh, for, for somebody at the top of the hierarchy... To have a true, deep empathy for somebody lower in the hierarchy is better than, the, than them not and, and more in tune with the kinds of values liberals profess. But I would say, I, look, I didn't mean the, the piece to suggest that the, the Army was a, a you know, paragon for your yeah. social equality. In fact, right. one other thing the Army has going for it in ter in, 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 on the egalitarian front is that the material differences are not that huge. The, the gap in salary between a, a general and a sergeant major, the ratio of those salaries is much lower, I'm sure, than the ratio oh, of, of a CEO to a shop foreman. So they're really, the, the material inequality is not huge. The range in housing is not all that huge. Um, I mean, you know, there's a clear difference, but you don't, you know, it, it's narrower than in the private sector. Um, and I think that's all good. And also, as Jay Tolson and I kind of independently realized and, and, and talk, we talked about this in, in the email that, you know there's no private property property on an army base and, you, and you're very kind of aware of that you don't own your house and you, you don't own your yard seems to me you have a lot more screw you ability in the private sector in other words I work for Jacob Weisberg he's a great guy he's my boss but he's not like a general in the army in other words if he tells me to do something even if I were an employee of Slate I could say uh, I quit you could say right. that, but the ability to do that is, I think, for many people, a product of fairly recent developments. The, the nature of the economy has changed. It's much more uh, a series, a bunch of contractual relationships, m which can be broken on short notice by either party, than was the case 30 years ago uh, when you had the, the corporate employer for life, or at least the employer for life model. But people always quit their jobs. Bob. People That's always quit their jobs, American but it was a serious plot. dislocation. I mean, now you have a lot of people, and I'm finding this as, as Blogging Heads turns into a real company. These are the kinds of relationships, <laughs> by and large, we have with people. A lot of them are part-time. They have relationships with other people. I, you know, well, you, if things turn sour, it doesn't, it do, it's not a major dislocation for them to drop me uh, and, and, and well, you, spend more time working for somebody else. You have a special problem because you don't pay people anything, Bob. No, that's actually no longer true, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Uh, well, where's my money? Where's my check? Well, I don't know. I don't pay the people like you. Uh, oh, I pay okay. the people who, uh, who do yeah. work instead of uh, soak up the glory. Inequality rears its head. Yeah. I had, I had a couple other beefs with your piece. One is you boast about your upward mobility. Uh, you know, your, my father's your, upward mobility. Your your grandfather was a sharecropper. Everybody's the son of a sharecropper. Mm -hmm. It's like with the Well, you're the first one, Mickey, who told me. Wait a second. When I when I first told you that my grandfather was a sharecropper, you said to me, "You should make much more of that. That would be good for you." This is the first. <laughs> this is the first first I've breathed of it in writing, I think. And you what? told me this about I seven joke. years ago. No, I know you're joking, but it's true. You you apparently get amazing currency, amazing mileage out of having a grandfather who's a sharecropper. I mean. Clarence Thomas, remember, he was the grandson of a sharecropper. I'm like, well, whoa, do I get to be on the Supreme Court? I mean, I don't really think it's that big a deal. Being the son of a sharecropper would when be. Nick, Le Nick Lemmick claims that sharecropping led to welfare, so it, it, it's amazing that you escaped the welfare trap. There you go. But, um, but my point is, upward mobility is nothing compared with downward mobility, Bob. I beat you because my grandfather went the other way. 
He started off as a member of, of, a, of a very um, successful German industrial concern and moved to America and became a gardener. And to be able to do that uh, is a greater statement of equality than the other way around. Upward mobility has nothing to compare with downward mobility. You win, man. Okay, thank you. Once again, uh, I'm very impressed that you've made it to blogging heads coming, coming from origins like that. This, he was a really bad gardener. That's why, that's why we have to do something else. Um, the, uh, the other obvious point, and this is sort of a moose point, is you talk about uh, upward mobility and how it enabled people to get ahead. Well, there's sort of how a the two army did, yeah. The army did. That, that's sort of a two-sided sword because the more upward mobility we have, the more society becomes stratified uh, by skills and... Uh, you know, the fewer people there are on the bottom left to be centrifuged up to the top. Well, there are certain assumptions uh, underlying that, that claim. Dilemma. Sorry? Well, there's, there are certain assumptions underlying that claim. Well, that there won't be massive new immigration to get more people to be sucked up to the top, yes. Well, also that the people who don't make it up to the top the first time around uh, cannot be readily educated in a way that empowers them, or their children can't, the next generation or something. And you, you may be right. I'm just saying it's not. it doesn't well, follow kind of... Uh, in a deductive way, it, it, you're, there are certain assumptions. Well, there's a, there is sort of a genetic Hernstein assumption underneath, underneath right. it, yes, that's saying that uh, the people with high IQs uh, get to the top and the people left at the bottom are people with low IQs. And uh, Do you think that's not true? Well, there, there's some variation in, in uh, some genetic variation among the population. Well, and luck has a role, et cetera, et cetera, and all those things. But, but still underlying it, there's a current that you're fighting against if you expect upward mobility to continue at a steady state over the decades. You're fighting against the current that the people with high ability have already been sucked up to the top. And well, some it's of that almost to the extent that there's any genetic component. Yeah. Um, yes. But, um, it, but there's no evidence that we've, uh, you know, the, the, that that dynamic well, has, has played itself out or anything. No, 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 I agree. The, the other, the other, the other positive note I took, and this this relate, this is a, a segue into our next topic, is is uh, an article in the Wall Street Journal about Alan Blinder's views on trade. You know right, what we've seen in the last few decades with globalization is people with high skills, high IQs, high education, high analytic skills get ahead in the United States. The, the unskilled work gets shipped abroad. People who don't have skills wind up competing against workers in China and India. And in Bangladesh, and their wages get pulled down, so the gap opens up between the educated and the uneducated. That's what's been happening. That has particularly invidious implications because it implies that the successful people are not only richer, but they're smarter than the unsuccessful people, and it, it, it's a very nasty situation. What Blinder talks about is now we're going to start outsourcing jobs with skills, uh, analytic skills in particular. Uh, through fiber optics, there are people in India who speak English who can analyze just as well as analysts in America. So if, if a certain kind of sort of stock analysis and accounting and all sorts of highly educated professions here are going to wind up being shipped overseas, and it's those people that are going to lose their jobs. And the people that do the jobs that have to be here are the people who have jobs that require interpersonal contact. So not analytic skills, not smarts, but sort of emotional smarts, ability to deal in the culture with people emotionally. Those are the people, not the high What's IQ an example of somebody who can deal with people emotionally and so gets to stay? I mean, obvious examples are, you know, gardeners and service station attendants. I mean, it seems like the obvious examples tend toward the, the manual labor. Well, divorce, divorce lawyers is his example. Uh, okay. You, you can't ship that to India. You got to be able to talk with the husband and the wife and work something out. And, okay, therapists. You know, yeah. So those those people, and it seems to be that 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 holds up the prospect of ending this sort of vicious inegalitarianism where it depends on smarts, and it depends more on things that sort of everybody can do, or at least they're different. So there'll be a shakeup in the hierarchy. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I, I took that as an optimistic sign. In a way, I mean, it's not, I, I mean, the, the, the most optimistic scenario would be, well, all of these people who have been threatened by globalization are, are going to be pulled upward but through something or other, but it's more like half of the people who have been 
who have been benefiting or, or been thriving in this system are actually about to have the bottom fall out from under them and right. leads to relative equality too, not not the not the path I would have preferred maybe. Right. There's that there's the negative negative egalitarianism also, which is not completely undesirable, I think, if, if a bunch of uh, arrogant professionals realize that, you know, the economy can come and bite them too. Now especially since I mean there's very little correlation between income and happiness once you get much, much above the poverty level. Um, and the virtue of, you know, my profession is my profession has already been outsourced. So you mean blogging? I or uh, Yes, blogging. You mean Iraq the Model? Well, everybody in the world can blog. We got so. an email from Iraq the Model. We did? Yeah, apparently he doesn't have much bandwidth, but he can download our MP3s or something. He can't stream. That's great. I, I, you know, Bush mentioned him in a speech, which I thought was a very scary thing. Why? Because why? Why draw attention to the guy? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. But um, uh, so, uh, but if, if he has, I, I'm incredibly flattered if he has time to listen to blogging heads. I think you're the big draw for 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 our Iraqi audience, Mickey. Um. Uh, God, I hope not. Then then the war really has gone badly. Um. And anyway, I just thought, and anyway, that was, those are my points about your piece. Okay. I thought you were going to be more vicious. I'm, I'm kind of disappointed. I like your piece. Why should I be vicious? Oh, I thought you'd, you'd think it was a, 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 a little too sappy. Touchy-feely? Yeah. I, I don't worry about you being too sappy, Bob. No, it's not a, it's not a looming peril, by and large. You're but a, this, this, this a, time I got as close as I get. You're a cold, cold man. <laughs> not true. Um, so we wanted to talk about trade. I hear I segued in. We trade. did. That was such a deaf segue, Mickey. Um, okay. So yeah, the, 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 two, a couple of things have happened. We had the South Korean trade deal that was reached just in time because I guess Bush's fast track authority was about to expire, but since it hasn't, uh, Congress will be forced to just vote up and down and, and without amending the thing, which is really right. a prerequisite for ever getting any kind of trade deal done, basically. Is there, it, um, is there a prayer that this thing will pass? What? I, I'm not so sure. I mean, you look at it, and it seems like, you know, it helps out people in, in some white-collar service industries, and some farmers, but not all. And I was going to ask you, I mean, there, 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 there is, and meanwhile, it, it will expose some, some I, I assume, some factory workers to greater competition. Uh, certainly, you know, we, we are lowering, lowering uh, barriers to, to, to their manufactured goods. Uh, now, it's true that they are lowering them to some of ours, <clears throat> so apparently uh, their imports of autos <clears throat> will be lubricated. But I was going to ask you, I mean, are we, are we exporting any autos to South Korea? No, I mean, the idea that we're going to sell Fords in South right. Korea is insane. The, the idea that we could sell Toyotas made in the United States to South Korea is slightly less insane. But why, I don't understand why would Toyota ship cars all the way from the United States uh, to South Korea when they can either make them in Japan and ship them across a much shorter area distance or else they can build factories in Korea. Yeah. Um, so, uh, no, I, it seems to me this is the same old, same old with trade, which is, you know, they sell us cars, we sell them Hollywood movies. Uh, part of the deal was it increases well, the and, amount of And I think, I think people like lawyers and consultants and, and, well, and banks maybe sometimes um, benefit from these be, things. And, you know, yeah, look, lawyers are a Democratic goods. constituency, so maybe that will help this get through a Democratic uh, Congress. But, but on the face of it, still, by and large, it doesn't seem to me a natural to get through a Democratic Congress. Well, they're farming interests to benefit. I agree with that. But, but yeah, but it's, you know, it, it, it's, it, I would be, it, I, I wouldn't have even, I would thought this would have been a close question to get through a Republican Congress. And now that the Democrats are in charge, I just don't, I just don't see it, so... Let me, let me uh, quickly put down a, a challenge to Dan Dresner and ask him to explain something to me. He, on his blog, uh, where you will also find uh, big pictures of his new book, All Politics is Global, which is a good title, um, he, he says in, his, in billing this, this, two things happened. There was a South Korea trade deal, and also we slapped some tariffs or, or said we're about to on... Chinese exporters of glossy paper or something, and that was that was a big precedent because we hadn't been doing that, and that was the free traders worry about that. And so he describes these two things as two steps forward, one step back. The South Korea thing being the two steps forward, 
And the China thing being the one step back, I mean, of course, Dan is a, is a free trader. Right. Um, I have a question about whether South Korea is, is, is really something we should so celebrate for the following reason. It is another of these bilateral trade deals, and I guess our first big one with Asia, or at least lately. Um, and, and so it's, it's the alternative to doing things through the World Trade Organization, and, and one reason we're pursuing these alternatives is because things have bogged down in negotiations for, uh, at the World Trade Organization for, for, for freeing up trade further through, through that avenue. But it seems to me, for a couple of reasons, we should really worry if the WTO, you know, begins to atrophy while what we see is a flourishing of these bilateral trade agreements. And there's some speculation that the South Korea thing will trigger more and more of these big bilateral trade agreements. And, and why is one of the reasons Well, to one learn? is China itself. I mean, Dan says that China is only one step backward because, and one of the reasons it's only one step backward is because, in the end, he expects this to go to the WTO and the WTO to deem our punitive tariffs illegitimate, and so the whole thing will, you know, be resolved. But, but... That's only, and that's a very valuable function for the WTO to perform, but it seems to me it only has the strength to perform that to the extent that it's a big part of the whole thing holding international trade together. And, I, and I, it seems to me, common sense, that the more bilateral deals you get, the less power the WTO has. I also have this pet, like, you know, wacko visionary idea about what the WTO could do in the future, and I probably trotted it out here, but it's... But it's it's just that it could be the foundation for um, for real firm mechanisms of, like, international arms control and so on. In other words, it seems to me, you know, the, the, the trouble with things like, like the nuclear nonproliferation treaty is, are, are, you know, A, there's not that much incentive to join. There are, there are countries with nuclear weapons who just don't join so they don't get inspected. B, um, if there are violations among NPT uh, member nations... Uh, and like they tell inspectors to get lost or whatever, there, there, there are not, there's not these ready-made kind of sanctions that kick in. It seems to me, you know, the so you World wanna, Trade Organization is something basically everyone wants to be in. So you want to impose trade sanctions for people that violate the proliferation? I want to say, first of all, if you're going to be in the WTO, you do have to sign on to all the international arms treaties, okay? Right. If you're going to enjoy the benefits of the global economy, you have to help police the globe. But, and I and mean, so, yeah, in the long run, not tomorrow, yeah. it seems to me right. that, oh. that, that the WTO could be a real firm foundation for well, actual significant, you know, international well, policing well, of various fine, kinds but, because members would, A, have an obligation to participate right. in the policing, and, B, yes, you would have already spelled out punishments for certain infractions. So, okay, you, you, you don't let the inspectors in? It's not an international incident. It's already clear what's going to happen right. to you. A, B, C, D. You don't have access. Right. You have more expensive access to but, this market and that market and so on. But, but don't bilateral trade negotiations establish the political prerequisites for the WTO reviving? In other words, we don't want to join the WTO because a whole bunch of auto workers in the Midwest don't want to lose their jobs, okay? If they lose their jobs to Korean auto workers, to be crude and heartless about it, they're not there when the time comes to, to negotiate with the WTO. The Korean, you know, one, one country's trade is, one low-wage country is, is similar to another in terms of, of, of the harm it inflicts on the American economy. So you do the harm in the bilateral negotiations, and then you have the, the WTO come in and, and put it all together. So we administer all the pain to constituencies that suffer from free trade through bilaterally, well, and then once they're all, like, lying in the gutters, powerless. Well, the, tra the, pain, the, the pain is the same whether you do it through a bilateral or multilateral, isn't it? So, uh, so if, if they could successfully, you know, have, have a transition to administrating the pain or having a transition to competitive industries, however you want to call it, if you can do that bilaterally, it happens, and, and, and then I, I don't see where that is going to step down the road you want it to take. Interesting question. I'll leave it for Dan to answer. Um, the... Uh, I, but, I but, 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 but there certainly is. I mean, the, the, the fear is expressed by people in the know that, it, you know, if the bilateral treaties really acquire a whole lot of momentum, they slowly could further drain, you know, impetus from 
the negotiations of the WTO, and people could increasingly get, give up because they can get the benefits they want through the bilateral well, path. And that's that's the conventional wisdom I'm questioning. I know. Well, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I would be lying if I said I have an answer to it. Um, God, okay. We, you know what? We've gone on, like, a lot longer than we realize if you put these uh, yeah, files we've together. Got, well, and I've already goaded you into unaccustomed bellicosity and uh, professions of ignorance, so... What was my bellicosity? Oh, oh, oh. You oh. said your reptilian corps wanted to go to war with Iran. Well, it was a passing. It was a passing impulse that I had overcome before I even stepped on camera here. Yeah, but we noticed it. Okay. I was just admitting to being human. Oh, I understand. I understand. Well, that, even that is news to some people. Cute. To the ruthlessly exploited blogging heads workers. <laughs> um, I don't even get paid the minimum wage? Jeez, you? Okay. No. I think this might violate various labor standards. Why don't you look into those? I, by the way, when you find out what they are, it is my position that they should be uh, international, okay? You'll be happy <laughs> okay. to hear. Before In my world... Them, yeah. You could go do blogging heads in, like, Thailand, and, and you'd get the exact same protections you get here. That's not quite true. That's, an, that's a caricature of my you, view. But you did a blogging heads from Spain. What? You did a blogging heads from Spain. We did. We did the Barcelona edition. Yeah. And, uh, oh, we got a surprise coming up if, if things go as planned. We're going to have, we're gonna have uh, a blogging uh, head from the most uh, exotic location uh, ever. I mean, ever for blogging heads? Yeah. Well, it just has to beat Barcelona. <laughs> it's going to be Barcelona by a long shot, and um, it's going to be much less safe. Uh, Beirut, worse than Beirut. Uh, I'm not saying anything. Okay. But uh, we've gone on forever. You know, uh, I want to thank the uh, commenter in a user because he had call he, he he had said in an in, in an earlier comment comment session a couple weeks ago that my op eds are you know. I think legalistic, whiny, and pinched. Right. And, like, I could see the first two, but I just didn't really know what pinched meant. And I, went, I actually asked a couple of people, what does pinch mean? And they're like, I don't know. Like, you pinch somebody? Emotionally, con emotionally constricted. I guess that's it. Because then he took it back after this last sappy op-ed I, 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 I wrote. He apologized. Thank you, any user. Um, um, do you have any comments you want to call attention to? No, but I will link to the person who accused us of just... You know, just reacting to the day's news on Iraq, which I have pled guilty to. Yeah, no, that's what we are. Nattering nabobs of, uh, of ignorance. Okay. Now, I also want to say, you know, this genre of Blogging Heads movie trailers continues to flourish. Uh, I'll, I'll link to the one on YouTube that, that, that has kind of this Brokeback Mountain theme. Did you see this one? Um. No, I don't you think probably so. repressed it. I think I sent you the link. I think it's not something that either of us is actually especially eager to get out there, but I feel a duty to reward the creativity of Umbrella Man 92. At least that's the name on YouTube. It's it, it's well done. And don't forget the Blogging Heads t-shirts. And mugs. That, that's our business model. And the Mickey Cows pinatas that will be on sale soon. I hope you have another revenue stream. We're working on it. The finest minds and blogging heads are working on it. Okay. Okay. Good Good. Good to see you again after a very painful uh, lapse in our communication. Um, it's, as if, it's, it's as if it was yesterday. It's as okay. if the lapse never happened. It's like riding a bicycle, Mickey. Um, I, I don't even want to think about that. No, okay. it's not like that. Okay. See, see ya. ya.